most civilized people are out of touch with reality because they confuse the world with the world as they think about it and talk about it and describe it. Reality itself is not a concept. Reality is... And we won't give it a name. I hear a new world. I hear a new world. Calling me. Calling me. So strange and so real. How can I tell her? in store for me I remember when I was a little boy, people used to say to me, Alan, you're so weird. Why can't you be like other people? Well, I thought that was just plain dull. As far back as I can remember, into earliest childhood, I've always been absolutely fascinated with the idea of death. What would it be like to go to sleep and never wake up? How long has time been going on? How long will it go on? What was God doing before God created the world? And so when a child starts asking what happened before, what happened before, what happened, of course they get shut up by their parents. Oh, shut up and suck your lollipop. <laughs> when I was a little boy and I asked many questions which my mother couldn't answer, she used to resort in desperation to saying, my dear, there are some things that we are not meant to know. Now, I was never repressed by my father in this way. He always went along with my wonderings. I began as a little boy uh, to be a philosopher by wondering about such things as space and time and existence. And it always seemed to me absolutely extraordinary that anything existed at all. I was reading about Chinese and Japanese culture. And then I came across Buddhism as a kind of root force in those cultures, and I got absolutely fascinated with it. So when I was 15, I was attending King's School, Canterbury, which is at the very heart of the Church of England. And uh, I didn't approve of the religion they were teaching because they were teaching it in a very superficial way. They just gave us a lot of talk about church history and the evils of yeah. sex and so on. <laughs> I was bored. So I declared myself a Buddhist. Well, the British have an absolute incredible confidence in their own correctness. <laughs> Therefore, they can tolerate eccentricity in a way which Americans can't. So they said, jolly what, the man's a Buddhist. <laughs> and they, 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 they weren't upset in the least. All my professors and teachers and my father encouraged me in my strangeness. They said, at last, somebody is seriously interested in religion. I suppose the most fascinating question in the whole world is, who am I? Or what am I? You, sitting there with all your problems, with all your whole complicated life situation, now that image of yourself that you have is made up mostly of things that other people have told us about ourselves or by looking at ourselves in a mirror. In other words, what people meet and understand and what I understand as Alan Watts is a big act which is not really me. Most people in the West have been brought up to believe that they're in this universe as strangers on probation or as flukes in a system which is fundamentally mindless and mechanical. We say, as a matter of ordinary speech, I came into this world. Well, you did nothing of the kind. You came out of it. And just as an apple tree apples, so this galaxy peoples. In other words, we are not lonely, isolated egos inside bags of skin. We are the universe, each one of us observing itself. In Western culture, 
It is practically a basic assumption that existence is serious. But you see, we have been brought up in a mythological context where the Lord God definitely does take himself seriously. So that when we go into church, laughter is discouraged in the same way as it's discouraged in court. Now, it's my contention, my personal opinion, that existence, the physical universe, is basically playful. That is to say, it doesn't have some destination that it ought to arrive at, but that it is best understood by analogy with music. We say you play the piano, you don't work the piano. In music, one doesn't make the end of a composition, the point of the composition. Look at the people who live to retire and put those savings away. We thought of life by analogy with a journey, which had a serious purpose at the end. The thing was to get to that end, success or whatever it is, or maybe heaven after you're dead. But we missed the point the whole way along. It was a musical thing and you were supposed to sing or to dance while the music was being played. Every day in the urban areas, millions of people are absolutely wearing themselves out to do their work. And their work, you see, is completely divorced, something quite separate from their play. Now, this is one of the great insanities of our civilization. Don't make a distinction between work and play. Regard everything that you're doing as play, and don't imagine for one minute that you've got to be serious about it. See, this is the real secret of life to be completely engaged with what you're doing in the here and now. If you don't have a room in your life for the playful, life's not worth living. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. <laughs> Supposing you had to drive a bus in New York, which is a very harrowing job in the ordinary way, you must not take seriously anything about it. This is the first rule. It doesn't matter a damn if you don't get there on time, but it would be fun to go as fast as is consistent with safety. And therefore, you swing that bus, and you, you, you play things with the horn, you take the whole thing lightly. In the practice of Buddhism, there is no place for using effort. Sleep when you're tired, move your bowels, eat when you're hungry. That's all. This is Japanese ceremonial tea. It's good on a cold day. begin with the point that I am responsible for the way the world is. If I couldn't feel that, I'd have to blame somebody else. I'm not willing to do that. Robert Oppenheimer is reported to have said quite recently that obviously the world is going to hell. We are in very serious danger of destroying the biosphere, that is to say the whole envelope of living creatures which covers this planet through pollution, overpopulation, nuclear fallout, poisoning of our food, and very lack of food. Now, as to improving the world, the world is always improving. It may look to some people slow, but it's improving even when it is declining, because the world works in an undulatory process, like a wave. It goes up and it goes down, it goes up and it goes down. And it couldn't go up all the time, because if it did, we wouldn't know that that was up. The human race has to learn how to leave the world alone and let what is called the natural homeostasis, that is the self-balancing process of nature, take care of the mess. And we may have to come to the alarming conclusion that the universe is smarter than we are.
it seems impossible to think that this universe could have been authored by the naive idea of God as a sort of old gentleman who lives far above the stars in heaven, seated on a golden throne and adored by legions of angels. That seems a concept almost unworthy of the sort of universe that modern science has revealed to us. The word God is contaminated. Get down on your knees and be humble before your heavenly father. That it gives everybody the creeps. It just, it's just awful to say something like that. Imagine you're being watched all the time by your creator. You never escape from his judgment. Because what happened was that Christianity institutionalized guilt as a virtue. <laughs> God will not forgive you unless you apologize. You've got to come to God in a state of great penitence, and if you don't do that, you are liable to be confined in the dungeons of the court of heaven, commonly known as hell, for always and always and always. Now, I don't think that's a very nice kind of fellow. I mean, he, he, you, you wouldn't invite that sort of God to dinner. It is from principally white racist Christians that we have the threat of fascism in this country. Because, you see, they have a religion which is militant, which is not the religion of Jesus, which was the realization of divine sonship, but the religion about Jesus, which pedestalizes him, and which says only this man, of all the sons of women, was divine, and you had better recognize it. Okay, Jesus Christ knew he was God. Wake up! And find out eventually who you really are. In our culture, of course, they'll say you're crazy, or you're blasphemous, and they'll either put you in jail or in the nut house, which is the same thing. But if you wake up in India and you tell your friends and relations, my goodness, I've just discovered that I'm God. They'll laugh and say, oh, congratulations. At last you found out. Now, when did you become God? Now. Will you marry me? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sleep on your stomach or your back? <laughs> Sleeping is like politics. One sleeps on the right side, and then when you're tired of that, you sleep on the left. What is not God? There is nothing that is not God. Yeah, what, is sleep for you? what is sleep? The seventh day. <laughs> is boredom a problem? Yes, boredom is, of course, the problem. Did you have this much charisma before you discovered your true nature? <laughs> yes, but it came out in a different way. <laughs> when I'm asked in a student audience, why do you go around lecturing on these things? I say, because I'm a philosophical entertainer. <laughs> I was educated in England, but I fled to this country because the kind of work that I do, an independent philosopher who does not hold a chair of philosophy in a university, <laughs> I can't make a, a living at my profession in any country except the United States. These are very interesting to the young. They represent a new form of social rebellion. They dress in bizarre and colorful ways. They wear their hair long. They praise the effect on the mind of hallucinatory drugs, particularly the drug LSD. And the drug is extremely dangerous. Some of the abnormalities found in LSD users take the form of chromosomes being broken when they should be whole, or smaller than is normal, or the wrong shape entirely. This is an unusual hospital treatment center. The doctors and the nurses here wear ordinary clothing as part of the attempt to produce a non-hospital atmosphere. But it is a closed ward. You don't get out without a key. Why are you here? I found God and uh, made me feel quite good, you know. And my mother mistook this good feeling for uh, taking drugs, so she phoned the police. What's God like? Well, first of all, God is everything, so he is like everything. I can't describe to you the feeling that it gives you when your son says to you, can't you feel it? God is everywhere. 
it isn't a happy thing at all or an inside, it's a death wish. And I tried talking sense to him. I said, Jimmy, you don't see God till you die. I think our only hope lies in a concerted effort of education uh, so that young people will be aware that uh, uh, there is nothing smart, there is nothing uh, uh, grown up or sophisticated in taking an LSD trip at all, they're just being complete fools. A British psychiatrist by the name of Humphrey Osmond persuaded a British novelist by the name of Aldous Huxley to take a dose of mescaline. Aldous Huxley didn't simply deliver a private report to the doctors, he rushed into print and published a book called The Doors of Perception. When I read this, as a student of the psychology of religion, I was naturally fascinated, but unbelieving. I thought, you know, Aldous sometimes goes off the deep end. I knew him very well. But then the psychiatrists who had involved him in this uh, finally got in touch with me. So I was foolish enough at the time to accept an invitation to being dosed with 100 micrograms of lysergic acid diethyl amide number 25. And I had an extraordinarily interesting experience. <laughs> but I felt that it was an aesthetic experience, not a mystical experience. Like looking through a kaleidoscope telescope instead of a telescope telescope. And it just jazzed everything up, and that was very interesting, and so what? Then later on, another psychiatrist approached me, he was in San Francisco at Langley Porter, and said, I don't think you've really gone into this deeply enough. <laughs> so I said, okay, 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 let's try it again. could not deny being a, an experience of cosmic consciousness, the sense of complete, fundamental, total unity forever and ever with the whole universe. And not only that, but that what this thing was fundamentally, despite everything and every kind of appearance in ordinary life to the contrary, that the energy behind the world was ecstatic bliss and love. Well, I was very embarrassed by this because I thought, gee, you can't get mysticism out of a bottle. But yet I couldn't deny the fact that it had happened. The basic transformation of consciousness, which comes about through the use of psychedelic chemicals, is probably best described as one of polar feeling. And therefore you see in a funny way that all human behavior goes together in such a way that you cannot have saints without sinners. You cannot have cops without robbers. You cannot have the good and the valuable in life without the background contrast of the failure and the evil. And also you cannot have life without death. So that you arrive sometimes at this funny point of view where you see that everybody, however bad, has an essential contribution to the totality of life. Is it perhaps providential that at this time in history, a chemical agent makes itself available, which will enable us to treat the disease of alienated consciousness, of hostility to the world. Suddenly, the whole world of young people caught on to this thing and said, let's turn on, let's have this experience. And then when Timothy Leary got in the act, all caution was thrown to the winds, and he felt that this is something that everybody really owed to himself. Drop out of high school, drop out of college, drop out of graduate school, turn on, tune in, drop out. <laughs> well, I wasn't so sure about that, because I wouldn't say everybody ought to sail around the world in an open sailboat. I wouldn't say that everybody ought 
to spend three weeks absolutely alone in a forest to find out who you are. If you can take it, it's a great experience, but I wouldn't want to shove it down your throat. So we must regard these things as very strictly instrumental. They do not do for you anything which you yourself don't bring to it. And what should be public policy with regard to these things? I feel very strongly in a country where we value freedom, we must not attempt to legislate morality. Respect for our policemen in this country ceased when prohibition came in fact. They became hypocrites, therefore armed preachers. And when you put guns into the hands of clergymen, <laughs> you've got real trouble. <laughs> You know you're going to die. We say there's one thing certain, it is death and taxes. Our culture is one in which death is invariably something swept under the carpet. Mm. We pretend it doesn't really happen. What worries us is that when we're dead, there could be nothing at all forever, as if that was something to worry about. Before you were born, there was this same nothing at all forever, and yet you happened. And if you happened once, you can happen again. When you're dead, you go into the negative dimension of unconsciousness, like you do when you go to sleep every night. Now, sleep refreshes you. Isn't that curious? Sleep is a very little understood phenomenon. But being unconscious for a while, being nowhere, brings you back to life. Of course it does, because you wouldn't know you were alive unless you'd once been dead. If we never died, not only would our world become hopelessly overpopulated, not only might we become utterly bored with century after century after century of experience without intermission, we might crave death. So the point is, you don't need to survive. We don't really have to go on living. It is very important at this time that human beings cool it, that we reduce the volume of our anxiety and take things easy. A lot of people don't know they're alive unless they're making a tremendous vibration. A lot of people need to get behind the wheel of a car or a plane that goes vroom, and come on with tremendous energy, very strong. See, that shows I'm a man. But if you're a real man, you don't need to show that at all. And I would suggest instead, you just put your hands on your hips with the wrist upwards. And now, let's all laugh. What do you desire? What would you like to do if money were no object? How would you really enjoy spending your life? If you say that getting the money is the most important thing, you will spend your life completely wasting your time. You'll be doing things you don't like doing in order to go on living, that is to go on doing things you don't like doing, which is stupid. Better to have a short life that is full of what you like doing than a long life spent in a miserable way. And after all, if you do really like what you're doing, it doesn't matter what it is, you could eventually become a master of it. It's the only way to become a master of something, to be really with it. And anything you can be interested in, you'll find others who are. But if you act with the thought in mind that as a result of action, you are eventually going to arrive at some place where everything will be all right, then you are hopelessly condemned to what the Buddhists call samsara, the round or rat race of birth and death. There's nothing to get hold of because you don't need to get hold of anything. You had it from the beginning. It all starts right now. You don't define yourself in terms of what you've done before, but in terms of what you're doing now. The future is a concept. It doesn't exist. As the proverb says, tomorrow never comes. There is no such thing as tomorrow. There never will be, because time is always now. Don't hurry anything. Don't worry about the future. Don't worry about what progress you're making. 
just be entirely content to be aware of what is. Hum. On the one hand, I'm a shameless egotist. I like to talk, entertain and hold the center of the stage. On the other, I realize quite clearly that the ego named Alan Watts is an illusion, a social institution, a fabrication of words and symbols without the slightest substantial reality. How can I say this without offense, without seeming proud, haughty and pretentious? I simply and even humbly know that I am the eternal. Yet, the idea of my coming on as a messiah or great guru just breaks me up with laughter. <laughs> because <laughs> everybody knows, it's a matter of public knowledge, that I'm a rascal. I am a, an immoderate lover of women and the delights of sexuality, of the greatest French, Chinese and Japanese cuisine, of wines and spirituous drinks, of smoking cigars and pipes, of gardens, forests and oceans, of jewels and paintings, I couldn't sustain the role of a clergyman mm. in those days. I was much too much of a bohemian to wear the Roman collar mm. and the black suit and uh, come on like I was holier than thou. I'm not a preacher. That's the most important thing to understand about me. I'm not trying to talk to you as an authority. I'm trying to talk to you as somebody who's opening your mind up, a helper, not a father figure. And therefore, everything I'm saying to you is a very elaborate deception. I'm weaving all kinds of intricate nonsense patterns which sound as if they were about to make sense and, and, and they don't really. <laughs> as a personality uh, who's in the, before the public eye, Alan Watts, uh, I'm a bit of a fake. Maybe a genuine fake, but still I know that behind the front that I present to the world is a good deal of scotch tape and wire and string and the <laughs> stuff that holds it together. And I say this to give you courage to go on with your show. <laughs>